Good day, everyone. We are on the third online continuing professional development platform for Asian Radiologic Technologist Societies. Hosting now is the Philippine Association of Radiologic Technologists, Art Philippines. I am Peach D. Luna, your program moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, to give the short message, let me let us all welcome the presidents of the different RT societies and associations. Let me start with the president of the Philippine Association of Radiologic Technologists. May I have the honor to read to you the message of the part president. President Rolando Benares is grateful to all the society presidents for the great idea of creating an online activity amidst the pandemic. With these challenging times, the societies of RTs has the common goal to continue providing support to the radiographers and radiologic technologists working as frontliners to continue developing their competence and meet the quality of patient care and provide a high value impact radiological services. He hopes that we will continue supporting each other's activities and share valuable support to the objectives of all societies of radiologic technologists. Babuhay. And now, as we continue, let me now call the president of other societies to give their short welcome message. To start, I would like to call Sir President Fernando Koch of the Macau 
uh, Radiologic Technologies Association. Sir Fernando Hello. Koch. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I am Fernando Koch, President of the Macau Radiological Technology, Technology Association. Welcome all of you tonight, the third TBD of the Asia. I hope everyone can learn some things and can and hope uh, all of you to support us. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Fernando Koch of the Macau Radiology Technologies Association. Next is the President of the Indonesian Society of Radiology Technologies, President Gek Sugianto. President Gek Sugianto. Hello. Good evening, everyone, the panelists, speakers, and all audience. I am Gek uh, Sugianto, President of Indonesian Society of Radiographers. I hope everyone is safe and well. Welcome to the third CBT Asia program. It is uh, a great honor for me as a president of PARI to be invited to this event as panelists. On behalf of Indonesian Society of Radiographers, I also would like to say congratulations to the ARD and team for hosting uh, this event. I know it has been a difficult time for everyone due to the pandemic, but I really appreciate the participation and enthusiasm of all audience to join this event. I hope we can use this opportunity to share knowledge and experience amongst radiographers in ASEAN countries. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, President Yek Subianto. Next we have is the President of the Vietnam Association of Radiologic Technologies, President Tsai Ban Lok. Yes, good evening, all panelists and audience in Philippines and Indonesia, Myanmar, and Macau, and in Cambodia. Thank you so much. I need to everybody support, support for Asia. Uh, CBD continues. I'm going to tell with everybody um, in May in Macau, host Asia CBD, uh, Asia CBD uh, in May, and I want to invite everybody in Asia CBD. We, we support everybody support for us. We host. How is Asia and Asia CPD in 27 Sunday Zoom? We will host, we will host how is Asia in, in I, I, I will in, invite everybody, send updates, I will send for everybody information. Uh, we will have imagine lesson. We will have a radio therapy system. We also will have a new, new blade medicine system. I we would like to invite all audience send for us. Of course, we will send for your society information more and more about in Southeast Asia again Sunday twenty seven June. Thank you so much, everybody. Good now with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, as we all know, the Myanmar is uh, facing um, a challenge at this point. And so we would like to say to all participants from Myanmar and the mountain that we hope that in the next uh, CPD online platform, we would be able to have you again here in our program. But we are lucky now, though, that we have Mam Sofik Lee, uh, the president of the Cambodian Association of Radiologic Technologies, to give us also a short message. Mam Sofik Lee. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I am the new president of uh, Cambodia Radiology Association. Technology. So, uh, 
today, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for everyone inviting me to join here. So, this is the first time I joined that I feel uh, too much warm will come from us. So, I hope uh, we are still continue like this, even uh, we have the COVID outbreaks, but we still continue have the communication with each other and share the information and learning from each other. So thank you again and again for the the kind of the time and opportunity to join for uh, us uh, this time also. So thank you so much uh, on behalf of association in Cambodia. We would like to say thank you for all of you for your support from the beginning and until now. So much. Thank you very much, uh, Cambodian. Association of RT President Long Sophie Lee. We are very much excited and looking forward to working with you in mm -hmm. the upcoming activities of the City of Asia. Okay, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, dear presidents. They will again be joining us later in the QA session as our panelists. So as we continue now, before we proceed with the lecture presentation, your account is currently be being used in another location. So Please log out from the other location and try again. watching of the lecture presentation also after presentations we will have the q a portion our two speakers will give time to answer your questions when you would like to send your questions please type your name your hospital affiliation and to whom do you address your questions so it will be easy for us to direct the question to the speaker and uh, in case again we fail to answer all your questions uh, we will be glad to answer your questions via email. So now, as we continue, let me introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Jose Carlos de Aguilar. He is a doctor of medicine and passed the PRC Regulation Commission for registration for professionals in 2015. He is a radiology diplomat of the Philippine College of Radiology. He is the he is connected with St. Luke's Medical Center Global City. To give us a lecture entitled Prostate MRI, let us all welcome our first speaker, Dr. Jose Carlo Aguilar. Good day. This is Jose Carlo Aguilar, currently a CTMRI fellow in St. Luke's Medical Center in Bonifacio Global City. The objectives of my lecture for today is to know basic anatomy of the prostate gland, to know basic patient indication and preparation prior to the procedure, and to discuss the required sequences for proper evaluation using PIRES version 2.1. Examination of the prostate gland is usually done using a 1.5 Tesla or 3.0 Tesla MRI machine. The difference between the two will include an improved signal-to-noise ratio for the 3.0 Tesla. Newer machines can be conducted with reasonably decent quality even without endorectal coils. However, one should consider the following situations including uni or bilateral hip arthroplasty, MR conditional implants, or devices requiring a lower field strength and extensive tattoos in the pelvic girdle area. In St. Luke's Medical Center, the more common procedure we perform is the multiparametric prostate MRI. This combines anatomic information from T1 and T2 weighted sequences with functional information from diffusion weighted imaging and dynamic contrast enhancement. 
the main differences of acquiring multiparametric prostate MRI versus biparametric prostate MRI is the presence of contrast sequences in the multiparametric prostate MRI. MRS or MR spectroscopy may also be included as an additional sequence in the multiparametric prostate MRI, but it is not routinely done. If patients are with budget constraints, a biparametric prostate MRI is considered. Prostate MRI indications includes the following. To detect and localize clinically significant prostate cancer in patients with a negative or without a previous biopsy, for active surveillance, prostate cancer staging, and detection of recurrence. Patient preparation will include an interval of more than or equal to six weeks in post-biopsy procedures for the prevention of diagnostic compromise due to post-biopsy changes, bowel motion artifact reduction with antispasmodic agents like buscopan, fasting period of at least four hours, and bowel evacuation prior to the procedure. Abstinence from ejaculation of at least three days is also recommended for a proper distension of the seminal vesicles. However, no clear established benefit is seen. So let's move on to the prostate MRI anatomy. So the ejaculatory docs ends at the prostatic urethra at the paramontanum. The transition zone surrounds the prostatic urethra. This zone enlarges in aging men resulting in benign prostatic hyperplasia. The central zone lies behind the transition zone and surrounds the ejaculatory duct. The peripheral zone is the largest area situated on the posterior and lateral side. The anterior fibromuscular stroma is a thickened area of tissue. It surrounds the base and mid portion of the prostate on the anterior side. So the prostate is divided into the anterior and posterior part. It is divided in the base, the mid portion, and the apex. Each part is subdivided into 12 sectors. It employs 39 sectors, 38 for the prostate, two for the seminal vesicles, and one for the external urethral sphincter. In our institution, it is important to have lower abdominal sequences, including T1 and T2 weighted sequences, to assess local or distant invasion or metastasis as seen in this slide. It is usually taken above or at the level of the aortic bifurcation. For this particular case in the right, a staging of T4N1 M1B is demonstrated, which shows an enlarged right iliac lymph node and right proximal femur bone metastasis as pointed by the reference arrows. Other helpful sequences are also taken including actual steer and GRE sequences on the last two slides, but these are optional depending on the institution. So let's discuss the multiparametric prostate MRI sequences. DCE or dynamic contrast sequences. We also include the T2-weighted 3D acquisition, which will be discussed later. For T1FS sequences, the purpose of which is for the general overview, it is for the detection of prostatic hemorrhage, pelvic bone, and soft tissue characterization and assessment of lymph nodes. It is taken in eggshell plane, and slice thickness and in plane resolution may be increased for increased anatomic coverage. So the T2-weighted images are required for glandular morphology. It is also the main sequences or sequence for evaluation of the transition zone. Assessment of extraprostatic extension and seminal vesicles are also better seen in the sequence. It is important to take the sequence in all planes, including axial, sagittal, and coronal, with a slice thickness of not more than 3 millimeters. The DWI ADC sequence goes hand in hand in assessing for the reflection of random motion of water molecules and adds a key functional component in the depiction of hypercellular tissue, which is highly correlated to malignant cells. This is the main sequence for evaluating the peripheral zone. High B values are necessary to create a high signal to noise ratio 
and a B value of at least 1,400 is recommended. In this slide, a T2 weighted hypointense lesion was detected and located dorsally in the peripheral zone of the mid portion of the prostate on the right. This is also markedly hypointense on ABC and markedly hyperintense on DWI. The lesion does not abut the pseudocapsule and there is no sign of extraprostatic growth. Pirates 5 is the impression with a Gleason score of at least 3 plus 4, which means intermediate chance for aggressive cancer. In our institution, we take two HL sequences of B1000 and B2000 respectively. You can also add oblique sequences if needed. So the dynamic contrast enhancement is needed to improve differentiation of equivocal versus likely malignant peripheral lesions, which increases the pirate score if the suspicious lesion enhances. It is also important for evaluating of local regional recurrence in a post-prostatectomy setting. Injection of contrast of at least uh, 0.1 millimoles per kilogram at 3 ml per second with a temporal resolution of at least less than 15 seconds. So sagittal and coronal planes are also taken for better assessment. So the prostate PD T2-weighted images are taken for the purpose of glandular morphology and may be taken in axial, coronal, or sagittal views depending on your institution's protocol. So here is the sagittal view. And the coronal view. So moving on, additional pointers are to use the same examination volumes and angulation for HLT2 weighted DWI, ABC, and DC images. Use the same slice thickness for all sequences except 3D imaging, which may be less than 7 millimeters. Possible, calculate high B value in a patient with hip arthroplasty and use metal artifact reduction algorithms if possible. So I'll just show you an example on how we interpret the prostate MRI once images are acquired using these representative images with axial and coronal T2-weighted images on the top and DWI ADC with high B value on the bottom. So what we see here is a T2 ill-defined, moderately hypointense expansile lesion in the anterior and posterior peripheral zone, base to apex with extension to the right peripheral zone, and bilateral transition and central zones. Pulsi of moderate to marked restricted diffusion are also observed, predominantly in the left peripheral zone, base to apex. Eventually, we diagnosed this patient with a uh, pirate's pipe with extraprostatic extension as well as enlarged lymph node and osseous metastasis. The tumor staging for this was T4, N1, M1. So here are my sources. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Our first speaker, Dr. Jose Carlo Aguilar. So our next speaker is Mr. Anthony Ariola Rodriguez. He is a senior magnetic resonance imaging technologist at St. Luke's Medical Center, Bonifacio Global City, Philippines. He is also a member of ART and other local ART organizations and has made uh, RT researches like in that dimension of research. Ladies and gentlemen, to give us a presentation on stroke imaging, brain attack protocol in MRI, let us welcome our second speaker, Mr. Anthony Ariola Rodriguez. Thank 
Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about stroke imaging for brain attack protocol and how important Hello. it is for stroke management. And also, how CT and MRI plays a big role in stroke imaging. So what is stroke? It's a sudden onset of focal or global neurological deficit due to an underlying vascular pathology. What are its main principles? Stroke is a brain attack. Stroke is an emergency. Stroke is treatable. But more importantly, stroke is preventable. What is the golden hour for stroke? 3, 4.5 hours is the last the patient, meaning the last time you saw the patient in a normal condition. When do we activate that? All adults 90 years old and above who are suspected of having a stroke within 6 hours from the symptoms of onset or within 3.5 hours upon waking up. So, nasa talaga, okay. So, then you had a symptoms of stroke. The ictus would be in the time when the patient woke up. What skill is used to assess a practitioner of service the signs and symptoms of stroke? Internationally, we use the Zenati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale with a methodology of face, arms, and speech. But here in St. Luke's, we use the B fast assessment tool. B for balance. Patient is experiencing loss of balance or probably having the worst headache of their lives. E for eyes. There is blurring of vision. F for face. One side of the face is drooping or asymmetrical. A for arms. Arms and legs are weakened. S for speech, or the patient is experiencing difficulty speaking or dyspagia. Time. Time to call the ambulance. Always remember, lost time means lost brain. What are the two types of smoke? Unique. Ischemic stroke occurs when there is a blockage of blood vessels in the brain. This accounts to 70% of cases of stroke. The blood flow is blocked and brain area is deprived of the blood supply. There are two types of ischemic stroke. The thrombosis and embolism. Thrombosis. Blood cuts that form in the blood vessels of the brain. Embolism. Blood clot formed from another location, usually from the heart. Another type of stroke is the hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic stroke is bleeding within the tissues and spaces around the brain brought about by a rupture of blood vessels. This accounts to 30% of cases of the brain attack. And there are two types of hemorrhagic stroke. The intracerebral and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Intracerebral are types of hemorrhagic stroke that present blood within the tissues of the brain, usually caused by uncontrolled hypertension. Arachnoid hemorrhage, a type of hemorrhagic stroke, where blood spills around the coverings of the brain and called arachnoid spaces. This is usually caused by a ruptured aneurysm. So, it is preferred to do the imaging in MRI. And for hemorrhagic stroke, it is preferred to use the CT scan imaging. What is thrombolysis RTPA or actalis? RTPA stands for recombinant to monogen activator. Especially the first to find the stroke. It is given within the heart of the heart. In both of the to any eligible stroke stroke patient, it is awaited by the stroke team to miss the stroke criteria of registration. What are the contraindications for this drug? Number one would be the advanced age, severe hypertension, rapidly improving the minor symptoms. If your onset, severe stroke, recent myocardial infarction, now uh, with diabetes, in a pathology, 
cranial plasm, antivirus malformation, or uninterrupted intracranial aneurysm. There is a recent GI bleeding or any recent major surgery. The highlight that we use is the National Institute of Neurological Disorder and Stroke Timelines Back Response Time. Here is our table. Go to doctor first position and bring attack activation to takes about 10 minutes. Go time to stroke team, meaning on the activation, the stroke team has five minutes to be able to assess whether the patient is a clinic or a, a hemorrhagic infarct patient. Uh, Dory time to neuroimaging initiation, whether the patient will be going to CT or MRI, they have 10 minutes. Now, Dory time to neuroimaging done and read, meaning CT and MR has 20 minutes to be able to complete the scanning and have an initial review. Okay. Okay. We have a procedure of RTPA, where the patient has a skinny part and a candidate for RTPA. Uh, the time to needle would be 60 minutes, meaning they have 15 minutes to do so. Now, the time to neurosurgery, they have an R. Meaning from the very time or from the patient, from, from the time the patient arrives from the ER, it will take us about two hours, and by two hours, uh, the surgery should have been started or should have already been done. Now, very time to monitor bed, ASU, and CCU, or OR, or CAT lab, would take, would take about three hours. For the members of the brain attack team, they're subdivided into three groups. The medical practitioner on duty, paramedical medical associates on duty, nursing associates on duty. For the medical practitioners on duty, they are namely neurology, neurosurgery stroke consultant, neurology and neurosurgery resident, medical resident, emergency care service consultant, radiology consultant, clinical pathologist, and endovascular specialist. For the paramedical associate on duty, they are namely funeral pharmacist, medical technologist, radiologic technologist, and for the nursing associates on duty, they are namely emergency care service nurse, bedside nurse, stroke nurse, house manager, cat lab nurse, nursing assistant, and patient care assistive personnel. Our MRI machine here in St. Six are the Philips Achieva 155 Tesla, Philips Achieva 3 Tesla, Philips Ingenia 1.5 Tesla. But due to the pandemic of COVID-19, we designated that the Philips Ingenia 1.5 Tesla would be the one to be used during bad, bad patients. MRI stroke protocol or MRI back protocol can be done within 20 minutes. It is composed of diffusion weighted image or DWI and apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC. DWI and ADC provides an image contrast that is dependent on molecular motion of water and its most sensitive method to date for the description of ischemia in the hyperacute stage. But it should be remembered that DWI lesions can be least partially reversible in the very early phase of ischemia and the size of DWI abnormality does not necessarily reflect the irreversible damage of tissue. T2 and fluid attenuated inversion recovery or flare in T2 and flare images, ischemic infarction appears as hyperintense lesion, usually seen within the first three to eight hours after the stroke onset. In a recent study of acute ischemic stroke patients studied by the MRI within six hours of symptoms onset, patients without the visible hyperintense lesions and flare images had a greater than 90% probability of being English within the first three hours of symptoms of onset. Thus, a mismatch between the positive BWI and negative flare appears to be useful in identification of the patients who are likely to benefit from thrombolysis. Also, flare images are also sensitive for sub alcohol hemorrhage, as well as cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. For the gradient recall echo or GRE, hyperacute stroke images demands a differentiation between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Moreover, microbeads can be seen not apparent on CT. 
el que no se detecte entre una trombosis o una trombos a very low signal region of magnetic susceptibility. For actual TOF, <coughs> or time of flight, the sequence speaks vascular flow of repeatedly applying radio frequency pulse to a volume of tissue followed by the pacing and refacing regions stationary to tissue in the volume that becomes saturated with the repeated excitation of pulses and has relatively low signal. Conversely, inflowing blood photons are not saturated and therefore produce relatively increase in signal intensity. 3D TOF MRA are preferred techniques for examination of intracranial vessels. MRA is, is particularly useful in detection of the vascular occlusion or stenosis in patients with ischemic stroke. This is an example of hyperacute hemorrhage. Patient was caught to ER at 11 pages p.m. or auditory time. The basis of the patient is 11 a.m. With a history of progressive right side bed and upper lower extremity weakness, with stirring of speech or the, pa the patient is facing. Actual MR images shows a hyperacute hemorrhage in the left lentiform nucleus and a mass like effect adjacent to the suicide body and the left ventricle and with a mild relational event. For T2 and first signal, hyperintensities are appreciated in deep white matter regions. With both cerebral hemispheres may relate to micro, vascular, or ischemic myelination or gliosis. While cerebral volume loss, there is no aneurysm or stenosis found. Actual T1 spin echo shows an IC intense and hypo intense in the left lentiform nucleus with a mass like effect adjacent to the suicide body, left ventricle, and insula. For GR susceptibility imaging shows that susceptibility appearing at a low signal intensity due to blood deep white matter, both cerebral hemisphere, which may relate to microvascular cerebral ischemia demyelination or gliosis. For actual CT scan imaging, a hypo dense Hemorrhagic collection with associated perilational edema in the left ventricle nucleus is again noted with a volume of 23.2 cc by CT volumetry. For time of flight, there is no annulus seen in the circle of release. The A1 segment of the left ventricle cerebral artery is dominant. The middle cerebral arteries or distal, or distal branches are patent and normal. The intracranial and extracranial internal carotid arteries are normal. The vessel vertebral vascular arteries are unremarkable, so it's not species of the vessels. For an example of an acute infarct, a 16 year old male came to ER at 9 a.m. The latest time was 5 a.m. and this arteria. Non contrast MR study of the brain or the brain attack protocol with intra and extracranial angiography with type 1 was done. The more restricted diffusion and corresponding flare signals is identified in the left lentiform nucleus reflected with, reflective of acute infarction. There is no demonstration of intracranial hemorrhage or mass lesion. Minimum cerebral loss volume is noted. The ventricles are not dilated, midline structures are increased, and the cisterns and suicide are effaced. For the digital echo, there are no intracranial hemorrhage or mass lesion. Chronic blood products are in normal brain tissue. There are no visible cerebral microbleeds. And for that, Brain time of flight and geography. There are no focal aneurysm. The proximal cerebral arteries are adequately visualized. Intra and extracranial internal carotid arteries are in normal. The vertebral and the basilar arteries are unremarkable. There is no displacement of the vessel. For hyperacute infarct, candidate for RTPE, patient is 52 male. 3.25 p.m. The 
patient history is a symmetrical depth, straight speech, and also consciousness. Non contrast MRI study of the brain, brain attack protocol, with intracranial and extracranial angiography in multi internal view, was done in 1.5 in Genia. PWI sequence shows that there's a fossil restricted diffusion in the left parietal and temporal lobes of the insula, left middle cerebral artery territory without corresponding flare, hyperintensity is relating to hyperacute infarct. During the GRA sequence, there are no intracranial hemorrhage or discrete mass lesions found. But the actual time of flight, there's a single attenuation involving the distal M1 segment of the left middle cerebral artery. Contour irregularities are present in both internal cavity and vertebral arteries relating to arterial sclerosis. The rest of the proximal cerebral arteries are adequate and visualized without evidence of any significant stenosis. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, treating brain attack patients were modified. All BAT and non bat patients are treated as a possible COVID-19 cases. All responders must wear appropriate PPEs as recommended by the Infection Control Services. All patients must must be pre-transported with full precautions. Unit-based precautionary measure must be respected. Proper coordination between units prior to transfer in order to prepare the receiving unit. All stroke patients for admission must have a routine nasal and oropharyngeal COVID-19 PCR rapid swab for screening. COVID probable suspect inferior patients will be admitted at the COVID isolation room (ICU) even while waiting for COVID-19 PCR rapid swab result. Once negative, they will be moved to non-COVID units. For my references, I would like to acknowledge in which medical center stroke unit for the bad team, State Medical Center, Radiology Department, and the American Stroke Association. Thank you everyone for spending a little bit of your time listening, and everyone have a great day. Thank you very much to our second speaker, Sir Anthony Rodriguez. You can now open your camera, dear speakers, as we would like to welcome the questions typed in through the live YouTube streaming and from the IP video talk from our registered participants. So I think we have questions here to our speakers. Family, and also help me out in... Um, Delivering the questions from our dear participants. We would like to read read one. And I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Good evening to Joe from Indonesia. <coughs> Good evening. Mrs. Yes, my evening. sister. My sister. Yeah. Good evening. Please, yeah. Miss Putu, please. Yeah. yeah, you can comment maybe. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I see you to doctor. You have to speak here. But I, I, I have a question. Uh, with, uh, I think the, uh, uh, you, you uh, will ask a uh, question for, for Dr. Tony. I have a question for Tony. I'm worried. <coughs> I'm worried. How about in sen your center now? Okay. How about in prison stock? Stock prison? You, you know? We, we, I, I, I understand in Rome, uh, Rome time, Rome time very important. Yes, we select the city first or your, your center, you choose MRI. You, I, I think you, you speak, you have, you tell in, uh, in MRI, in all protocol in 20 minutes, I think, okay, good. But you remember very important also in in your center, in your center. First, uh, 
we do you choose a direct MRI, the first question. The second question, uh, COVID-19, the second question, uh, in COVID-19, you see, uh, you, you, you have uh, 19 patients in COVID-2 hosting, or very special. If you have a time, you can share for everybody. Patients stop and to get the positive in COVID-2. Very important how you can share with your experience for everybody. I think the, the, the second lesson you will you answer late. It have a free time for you. Okay, thank you so much. Sir, Sir Anthony, did, did you get the questions from Sir Kaiba Law? I think he is asking about whether in your center it's the CT MRI that CT that is first um, requested for a stroke case, or since you have a 20 minute uh, MRI scan only? And share more about how you do uh, stroke imaging using MRI for COVID cases in COVID patients. Okay, uh, here in the institution, uh, we treat all back patients or stroke patients or the brain attack patients as a uh, COVID patient. So uh, once um, once we are alerted that there's a bad patient, uh, we treat them as PUIs or PU, uh, PUM. And we need to have a, they call this, um, we need to wear our PPEs, our proper PPEs. And um, our machine is, the, as I have said on my slide, that we're using the Waffle 5 Tesla Ingenia, which is separated from the other two machines. So uh, we could be able to contain uh, the bad patients and uh, uh, avoid the spread of COVID-19. For the question, um, is it MRI the one that's being used immediately or is CT? It depends. Clinically, the doctor or the neurologist the neurologist would be the one who's going to assess it. If all, uh, if the clinically or uh, clinically they see it as a lead, lead uh, or hemorrhagic patient, or, or, or the patient has had a the kind of bleed, they would be uh, they would directly go to CT scan. And if it is a ischemic infarct, then they're going to decide to go to MRI. Uh, that's it. Sorry, uh, I, I, I'm worried. I'm worried. How how patient uh, the mood for you in twenty minutes? In, 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 you you check uh, your your protocol MRI. I'm worried. You're worried. Uh, you yes, don't you, you, I don't you don't think that it's going to be twenty minutes. It's going to be twenty minutes. Yeah, with me. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, we know. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Ah, okay. It's going to be 20 minutes because um, our actual T2, uh, we do have a fast protocol for T2. We have a fast protocol for flare. For T2, we can do it if in case um, we need to do it fast. There's a fast protocol for Philips, which is about 58 seconds. Okay? For flare, there's 1 minute and 36 seconds. For GIE, it's 1 minute and 50 seconds. For DWI, it's just 30 seconds and together with the EDC. And for TOF, uh, that's just three minutes and uh, three minutes and I think it's 50 seconds. For, uh, for the intracranial and for the thing is for intracranial, thing is for extracranial. So basically we can be able to do it that, uh, that quick. Okay, uh, okay. a lot of questions. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, there is a relative question to what uh, Sir Anthony Rodriguez has just said. There's a question from uh, Harry, Henry Pura White. Are, are, the question is, are they enough for 20 minutes to finish MRI bath, including HL TQF? Can you share yes. the tricks to make it done on 20 minutes and why you didn't 
uh, do a sagittal and chronal. Okay, because of the time, time constraint, we cannot do uh, all the sequences the sagittal and coronal. The purpose of that being paper to a very few protocols is one, so that we can be able to assess if it is a hyperacute infarct. Okay, that's very important for MRI because, for, because of the RTPA. Okay, and uh, if you're going to ask me how to do it fast in POF, uh, it takes a lot of years of experience to be able to do so. So, if in case I have a patient that is normal, I do try to run some very few uh, protocols for that. But the number one trick for that is to be able to, uh, we do have, uh, what do you call this? Uh, the pulse phone, you're going to be using the pulse phone. I'm using uh, the combination of sense, charm, uh, and also the combination for, um, with the proper combination of the voxel acquisition and, uh, and the proper matrix. Because if you're going to, if you're not going to be able to use the proper matrix for that, you're going to miss out occlusion on the vessels. It's very important. And most of the time, I try to use rest lab or pre-saturation so that we could be able to avoid unwanted, uh, unwanted artifacts on the vessels. Yes. Yes, thank you, Sir Anthony. Okay. Again, the, the, the cam is open for your questions to us. To our speakers, dear panelists, if you have any, you just um, give me a cue so I can allow you yeah. to deliver the question to the speaker. Yes, President Sudianto from Paadi, yeah. Indonesia. Hello, good evening, uh, the speakers, and also here, President Hin. Hello. In your country. Uh, maybe to Irma, to Irma. You can can uh, have a question, please. Ah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sudianto. Thank you, Pichi. If allow me, I have I want to add some points or add some questions. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, initially I thought the same as Mr. Locke that I always thought that CT scan would be the first choice for stroke imaging because time is very critical and we can do it very fast on CT to distinguish whether the patient has stroke uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic but it is great to know the practice in different countries that um, Mr. Anthony can do the uh, MRI yeah. uh, and that's uh, my points and actually I have a question to uh, Dr. Jose Carlo maybe yeah so I want to ask your opinion about what is the role of Prostate spectroscopy while the latest uh, PIRAD guidelines, no more using spectroscopy. And the second question is uh, regarding the sequence that you use for the MRI. Uh, what's the best sequence that we can use to distinguish the malignant or benign? Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, for the MRS or the spectroscopy, we usually don't employ it anymore uh, it's just for the uh like the study in the brain like lactate peak or um the ratio for creatinine and stuff it's not usually done anymore so uh what we usually do is just the multi-parametric prostate since it's already so uh enough to say if the lesion is on what pyrid score and then after that uh for uh, added learning uh, the pirate score, if it's more than four or five, uh, we usually um, refer them to, for uh, targeted biopsy. And we do this also in our center with, with the guidance of ultrasound. Uh, for the second question, uh, what was your second question again? I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I think the second question is about what is the best choice for uh, the sequence to differentiate benign or malignant. I think. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, for for a malignant uh, focus in prostate MRI, I think the best sequence would be it depends on what location. So as I said earlier, uh, when you're looking at the peripheral zone, you need to look at the DWI ADC maps. But when it comes to the transition zone, you need to look at the T2 weighted images. So it's it's better, or because of the glandular morphology of the prostate gland, some some areas are more susceptible for uh, proper distinguishing of what type of lesion it is. So mm -hmm. I cannot say which which sequence would be the best to assess uh, the for the for the malignancy, but it usually helps us in radiology to. Uh, get all the sequences together for a better interpretation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irma. Yes. Is there any other question from the panel? While you are preparing your questions, maybe. So I'd like to read another a series of questions here. I think this is for Dr. Aguilar. Uh, question is, is it necessary to acquire lower abdomen post-contrast images? Is it also advisable to do a non-contrast multi-parametric prostate? We have an ideal time to complete a prostate MRI. And uh, what can you say about contraindications for patients who have poly catheter? Okay. Uh, for the first question, uh it's the the sweet, do we need a lower abdomen sequence for post contrast uh it depends because usually when when we see some enhancement some 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 enhancement may delay on the post contrast images but on our protocol we just take the pre contrast lower abdomen sequence to check for uh, enlarged lymph nodes it and for uh, metastasis on, on the bones. Uh, this is done for different reasons because it may depend on the surgeon on what management they will take. For example, if you stage the the tumor or the prostate cancer with uh, metastasis to the iliac, iliac bifurcation, Uh, there will be a different management for this. It's usually the radiotherapy. Again, ma'am, can you repeat? If, uh, second question is, is it advisable to do a non-contrast multi-parametric prostate? Uh, it depends on the patient. If uh, there is, uh, he has budget or budget constraints. Yeah. And usually in our institution, we just, go to the multiparametric prostate MRI, which is the con included contrast. If you're talking about non-contrast MRI study, it should be biparametric prostate MRI. It's not multiparametric. Yeah. That's the third question. The third question, sorry for these years of questions, though. This came from one single person only. So what is the ideal time to complete a prostate MRI? Do you have an ideal time? Complete ideal MRI? time, um, well, in St. Luke's, it takes about one hour and 10 minutes, I think. I don't know with the red text, but for the 3.0 and 1.5 Tesla, they say it's usually one hour and 10 minutes. So maybe that's the ideal time. <laughs> And the last question from Shan is, is there, what can you say about the contraindications for patients who have poly catheter? Poly catheter. Um, there's no publication regarding uh, uh, the contraindication for poly catheter. I think there's another question that is asking if we should empty the urinary bladder before the procedure. Um, it would be wise if you do not empty it uh, because we also need to assess, as radiologists, we also need to assess the urinary bladder if there is extension of mass within the urinary bladder. And one best contrast to use for it is 
Twitters, there are any. Uh, for Foley Catheter, I haven't encountered or haven't read any journal regarding uh, uh, using it for uh, the scan. So I think it's okay. It doesn't affect the quality. Uh, just don't have any air within the Foley Catheter, which is very important. Dear panelists, would you like to help me read some questions posted over the chat box? Perkin Monty, welcome. We are glad yes. that you are all here. Everybody, and, uh, please excuse me because of the very weak internet, and, and uh, I can just uh, sign in just now. So I missed all the uh, speakers. Uh, uh, presentation, but anyway, uh, I I can uh, re uh, listen with the uh, YouTube again. Okay. Uh. Yes, thank you, King Mount Sir King Mountain, President King Mountain. Please do tell your members that they can still access the VART YouTube channel and what. Yes, because uh, yeah, you, you, you you know they are uh, very busy at the yeah, moment. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, so so I'd like to read some more questions here posted on the YouTube at uh, the Zoom chat box. Uh, so the question here is from Frank uh, Pandapokan. Is it correct? Uh, the question is in the head examination in MRI. I think this is for Sir Anthony. Can we see more extensive bleeding as a whole? In the head examination in MRI, I think this is for Sir Anthony. Can we see more extensive bleeding as a whole? Um, sorry, I didn't the question, catch yeah, them. The question here of Mr. Lowcott is in the head exam of the MRI, can we see more extensive bleeding as a whole? Mm -hmm. Extensive bleeding. When it comes to bleeding, there are a lot of uh, sequences that we can use. Jerry uh, is often used for that, but if if uh, but due to the constraint of twenty minutes, uh, we cannot even uh, we cannot do the SWI, which is more uh, for analysis for the blood or for the bleeding. Uh, but we can be able to see it. We can be able to see the. Uh, we can be able to see bleedings in GRE, but not but we cannot grade it that much. We need to use the SWI or susceptibility weighted image. It, it could be done after uh, after uh, the analysis of that. Maybe uh say it looks we do the completion scan. Uh, maybe uh, uh yeah we do the completion scan. Maybe we can do the SWI after the completion scan. That's it on each. Sorry, Mom, Peach, we cannot hear you. Uh, to our dear, speak to our dear speakers, I hope you can also um, read the questions. There are so many questions posted on the uh, Zoom chat box. Uh, you can uh, choose to. Trying to pick some more important questions here, like to read one. So here is the question for imaging of the prostate. So this is for Dr. Uh, Dr. Aguilar. Oh, sorry, to, to Sir Anthony. Uh, Sir Anthony uh, from uh, Mr. John Mark. His question is, uh, can you tell about uh, limitation of player MR imaging in dating acute ischemic stroke. Hmm, limitation. Have you? Uh, uh, so far, I didn't, and the idea had any experience in the limitation of the imaging in in acute infarct because uh, 
Your NT imaging is being used just uh, just to be able to assess. Usually, if you're going to do the bat uh, for the hyperacute infarct, uh, this is it's just for the comparison for the for the DWI images. Because if, if uh you want to use the DW because in DWI, hyperacute infarcts are very hyper hyper intense, and on EDC that's hyper intense. So, uh. But we could be able to see if we can be able to salvage some part of the brain during the stroke. So actual T2 and flare are used just to compare if uh if in case that we could be able to do the RTPA within an R. So most likely uh for bleeding, we cannot uh for, for bleeding, uh, it's not that very sufficient, as I have said a while ago be able to, to grade it or to be able to know uh, the, extent, uh, for the extent for that bleeding. We need to use the SWI. And sometimes, uh, maybe for this year, they're going to try to include also the uh, proficient weighted image. But uh, due to the time constraint, uh, they're still asking us if we can be able to do it within, uh, we could be able to squeeze that protocol uh, if it would not be possible to do it, with, to do it with 20 minutes because of the uh, preparation for the injection, preparation for the patient, and most of the patients are very involuntary when we do that, when we do the imaging. We still have for, uh, that's it. Uh, we just need to do the SWI to be able to, uh, to grade the bleeding uh, for the brain. Thank you, Sir Anthony. Uh, another question here, this goes for Dr. Aguilar. Dr. Aguilar, this question from John Karait. He asked of uh, the B values that you use for DWI for prostate. Okay. So the B values that we use, guideline is 1,400. Uh, we currently use the B1,000 and B2,000. Uh, why is that so? Because, uh, <laughs> and uh, if I can suggest, I mean, uh, we should, um, I think this is done in our 1.5 machine, but in our 3 Tesla machine, it's not yet calibrated. So that's why I showed you uh, B1000 and B2000 image. Mm -hmm. uh, B2000 image is done for detection of smaller lesions. It, it actually enhances, or it's actually hyper intense on uh, smaller lesions. And we must be careful to compute for the B value because it has the diffusion cortosis effect. So it it goes into a much grainier side if if okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar. Sir Anthony Rodriguez, um I think you can um read the chat box uh, uh here in our Zoom link. There's this question that you please help me uh interpret this question this is about mri of the brain and i think that the uh, saya pool amin would like to know more about how you do it with covid 19 patient cases can you share more about how you do mri of the brain with covid 19 patients uh most likely we do it um we have we were ppes and uh, here in our institution, we do have, uh, if the patient is really a COVID positive patient, most likely they have ventilators. So we do have a portable ventilators that's MR compatible. So, uh, we can, that's why we can be able to do the MRI also, uh, even if they have ventilators. Uh, as I have, uh, as I have understand, there's also a question if uh, we could be able to see COVID-19 in MRI brain. Actually, it's most likely uh, it's just the effect that we can be able to see. For example, if the patient has a difficulty of breathing and has a hypoxia, of course, the brain will be get affected. But we need to do perfusion for that so that we can be able to see for the extent of hypoxia. That's the only thing. But, uh, but uh, it's not general for anything that we can be able to see. Uh, we can be able to see the COVID-19 on brain. So it's just the effect that we can be able to see on the brain for the brain imaging of MRI. Thank you, Sir John Colleen. This, uh, her, 
your question is if two that code is activated who will be the be done first is it possible for spaces to do also an mri okay for the first question if there are two that pages that are being activated uh before in our uh before you know, a few years back uh the neuro neurologist would be the one to assess which is the one uh to be done in mri or if in case uh we can do the other one in CT scan but now if if that is the case and the and upon, upon assessment of the neuro neuro neurologist or the neuro resident we can do it also in three test lab but the problem for that is we need to sanitize or give uh we need to disinfect also the other machine for that we're going to do that uh this rarely happens but it's the call of the neurologist which one would be the one to be uh, done first and for the uh, we need to discuss with pathologist pathology uh, and emergency before to be we focus on examiner mri or ct it will take care i hope on everybody's support join with us and very important in 27 Sunday, June, Vietnam House, Southeast Asia, for also online, the same today. I would like to invite everybody in Philippines, Indonesia, Myanmar, and Macau in Cambodia support for us for a lot, uh, many, many um, presentations for us. I understand very important, very difficult for us when we, we, we organize the Southeast Asia or for it online. But I think that everybody can support for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Ivan Law. So, for our time session. We, we will be very glad to answer questions that has uh, have arise from the YouTube and from the IP video talk via email. But uh, as we continue, sadly we will have to proceed with the closing session of today's program. So I would like to share now the certificates that will be received by our participants. If you manage to complete Attending the program, you'll be able to receive via your email address the certificate of completion. We are very much grateful for your participation and we look forward to uh, having you again in the next CPD Asia conference. We would like to say thank you to our dear panelists, President Orlando Banares, President Fernando Falk. Now we have Sir Jerry Le Pedro Lay from Macau, MRTA. Thank you so much, Sir Pedro Lay. Uh, thank you so much, President Gexo Dianto. Thank you so much, President Team Mountain. We are so much happy to have you, uh, even as we know that you have a uh, challenge in your country right now. We hope you well. And President Taiwan Law. Thank you to our dear panelists. Most especially, we would like to say thank you to our dear speakers. Please receive the electronic certificate of appreciation from the CPD Asia Regional Technology Associations and Societies. Sir Anthony A. Rodriguez, thank you very much for your outstanding presentation. And we also would like to give the electronic certificate to Dr. Jose Carlos C. Aguilar. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar, for your time. I know you are very busy. I think you are in the hospital right now. Are you, sir, dear Dr. Jose? Are you in the hospital? <laughs> yes, I'm currently in the hospital. So we are so thankful that you were able to like join us. So thank you again, dear sir. We will meet that you were able to like join us. So thank you again, dear sir. We will meet again surely in the Philippines after COVID. -19. Thank you. So with that, I would like also to acknowledge uh, the help of the BT Healthcare IT team.
are very helpful for the health and all the technical support from the VTIT, uh, VT Healthcare IT team. We also would like to acknowledge the support of the chairman of the radiology section of Stinkus Medical Center, Global City and Kazan City.